um, I'm talking about data-driven chemical understanding. And I first wanted to start with a short introduction about the institute that I'm currently working at. So I'm working at the Bundesanstalt für Materialforschung und Prüfung, um, short BAM, the Federal Institute for Materials Research and Testing in Germany. So I'm talking to you today from Berlin. It's a Berlin-based institute. It's already quite old. Um, it started in the 1870s. And um, as you can imagine, it's situated in, in Berlin. It has a very complex um, history. The origins of these kind of materials testing bureaus um, lie in, in the need um, for testing materials such as um, steel and iron um, because um, railroads were coming up. Um, and this is um, also why, why BAM um, was built. Um, this um, quote here is from a book on solid state history that I really like and, and can also recommend. It's called Out of the Crystal Maze. Um, one of the first heads at BAM is um, Adolf Martens. Um, you might have heard, um, or the predecessors of BAM is Adolf Martens. You might have heard the word um, Martens hardness, and it's, it's going back um, to his research. So we are now um, working in a junior group at BAM in the materials chemistry department since uh, May 2021, since May last year. Um, and we're not the only people at BAM working on atomistic simulations and materials informatics. Um, also recently, um, other, other people have joined. Um, and I um, also have a second affiliation at the Friedrich Schiller University in Vienna. Um, I put both flags here on, on this little map so that you can see that these cities are not um, very close together. Um, the first PhD student in the group um, started in October last year, um, and since then we've, we've been growing. Yeah, as it was said, um, my background is in computational chemistry. I did a PhD at the RWTH Aachen University in the group of Richard Tronskowski. Um, already at the end of this um, PhD, I had my, my first interactions with the materials project. And this, of course, intensified when I, I went to Belgium to UC Louvain, um, also partially as a Marie Curie fellow. Um, there was in the groups of Reforti and Jean-Marco Reganez. And a lot of the research that I'm going to talk about um, still stems from, from this time. Um, and yeah, since May, as I said, um, we're now in this junior group at BAM and at FSU Jena. Um, yeah, if you'd like to um, know more, of course, you can visit um, my website. Um, and what I would like to talk today is um, about data-driven chemical understanding. And I will first start with um, the interplay or a discussion on the interplay between chemical heuristics and machine learning models. Um, then I will um, talk about the role of automation and give an example where we automatized um, a DFT-based analysis. And in all of this, um, the tools from the materials project will play a role. So the data um, and of course, um, the Python tools, um, PyMage and, and also Atomit. So we've all seen this kind of picture in um, yeah, hundreds of, of variants. Um, we are now in the so-called fourth paradigm of science. We have now enough data to do big data-driven science um, and understand um, with the help of machine learning, artificial intelligence, patterns and, and anomalies in, in data, do data mining, and um, maybe be able to write down models um, that researchers um, yeah, maybe used implicitly, um, but were not really able to, to formulate um, in a kind of law or in a kind of, of, of heuristic. But of course, um, this data-driven science is much older. And one example um, that you all know is the periodic table of elements, where researchers really found that the pattern, the rule, um, before understanding the other underlying quantum mechanics. And this is also um, what I would like to discuss about. I would like to discuss about this relationship between these, these classical heuristics and today's um, data-driven um, research. This goes mostly back to an opinion that um, I wrote together with Jeffrey Autier. It's called Chemist versus Machine, Traditional Knowledge versus Machine Learning Techniques. And it, it's really about this relationship between the second paradigm of science, which mostly relies on theoretical models um, and this big data-driven science. And there were um, yeah, two main points. Um, one that um, these classical heuristics could in principle be wrong because they have been built on very limited data and then chemical insights, so we should test them. 
And the other thing is, of course, that if you go to data-driven approaches and do not use any kind of physical insight, you need a lot, a much more data and you have to be really careful with the data creation. And uh, one question that also came up um, in, in this opinion is, is how does our current knowledge actually, actually influence the data that we're having? And for this, this first point here, um, that classical heuristics should be tested and also for this question, how does current knowledge influence the data? I wanted to show an example from another research group um, that was yeah, pre-printed recently, but which I found really interesting. Um, it's about the periodic um, yeah, system of elements. And it's um, researched by the group um, of Giuliano Restrepo in, from Leipzig. And it's basically um, a data-driven analysis of um, the evolution of, of chemical similarity as a function of time. They looked at the relationships between um, chemical elements in the periodic table in 1820, 1840, 1868. Um, and you can see in 1820, it was not at all clear um, how the relationships between the different atoms should be, which elements are actually similar and so on. In 1840, um, this pattern already becomes much, much clearer. Um, and already at that time, it might have been possible um, to um, derive something like the periodic system. Um, and then in the 1870, you can really see that there's a massive growth, um, as indicated by these cycles, um, on compounds from organic chemistry. So these relationships between um, yeah, elements which occur in more organic um, materials um, became much clearer. By the way, there's also a web application for this um, if you would like to check it out. Um, um, and um, yeah, I think um, this also connects to, to another um, work from this group. Um, and they say modeling of the evolution of chemical knowledge goes beyond the assessment of historical narratives. It embraces estimating the future of chemical knowledge and also the validity of its theories. And I think it connects really well um, to um, what we also thought about in, in our piece on these, these chemical heuristics. So we should really test these chemical heuristics and see how valid they are, how valid our chemical knowledge is based on data. Um, and now I'm coming to an example from my research where we did this um, as well. Um, and this is a test of um, the so-called Pauling roots. Um, they describe the stability of inorganic materials. Um, they are in um, solid state ke chemistry textbooks. They are taught, they are um, yeah, a basis for our yeah, chemical knowledge. Um, and they are a set of principles governing the structure of complex ionic crystals as Linus Pauling wrote in 1929. And they basically describe um, the connection of coordination environments to the stability of materials. Um, so they look at connections via, um, for example, edges and faces of the coordination environments with um, the stability of materials. They look at, at valences um, of the um, cations and anions in these compounds and also connect this to the stability. And just also to indicate on how much uh, or how limited the data was um, when, when they derived these, these chemical heuristics, um, I wanted to show the entries in the inorganic crystal structure database as a function of, of the year. And you can see in 1930, when Pauling derived his roots, they had several hundred crystal structures. And of course, it's really hard um, without, um, yeah, this access to this data here um, to derive any, any kind of, of words. Um, and um, he also had some basic ideas from electrostatics that he used in these kind of words. So for example, um, here um, tetrahedra are shown that are corner connected, then they are edge connected, and then they are face connected. And uh, Pauling's idea was um, that when you put cations in these tetrahedra, um, they are much closer together when these tetrahedra are face connected than when they are connected via corners. Um, and this 
electrostatic repulsion should lead to the fact, of course, that most of these kind of polyhedra should be actually corner connected. But Pauling was really also aware of this, this kind of um, problem that, that the rules were not um, rigorous. So we really wrote in this original piece that they are not rigorous in the derivation and also not on universal in the application. Um, so he was aware um, that they might not work for everything, um, but that there should be something that can help people to identify possible stable structures. So we then um, tested these polling groups. So we took 5,000 experimentally known oxides from the Matthias project, um, determined the oxidation state of the certain heuristic, um, then um, used the tool that's called um, ChemEnf that is implemented in, in Pyramogen to determine um, the coordination requirements. So what does ChemEnf do? Um, it uses a so-called um, continuous symmetry measure. So it compares um, positions of um, um, co coordination environments in um, real crystal structures to ideal shapes. Um, it, it minimizes the distance by rotating and, and, and changing the shape of, of these kind of polyhedra so that they fit best um, to the ideal polyhedra um, and then evaluates these numbers and, and can give you the, um, the coordination environment um, for, for a certain um, real um, structure. Um, one of the advantages of um, this um, algorithm is that um, if you go, for example, from, from an octahedron to a square pyramidal coordination environment, you do not get a sharp transition as you would have in, in many algorithms. So at some point, um, you would just have 100% octahedron and then you deform it a little bit more, you would go to the square pyramidal coordination environment, it has um, rather than a smooth transition between these coordination environments. Um, yeah, you can also use this tool, by the way, um, in web app that was um, yeah um, designed by Matthew Horton. Um, it's the crystal toolkit and is a part of um, um, the Matthias project um, websites. Yeah, we then use this tool to um, yeah really determine all coordination environments in our 5,000 oxides. Um, then we wrote a code to test um, each of the polling groups. So we're not go through all of the routes now, we'll just show, show one. Um, if you'd like to know more, um, please read the publication. Um, yeah, I will go um, and discuss this third rule, this sharing of edges and faces. I've already explained the electrostatic reasoning behind it. Um, and the rule reads the following, the presence of shared edges and particularly of shared faces in a coordinated structure decreases its stability. So corner connected um, polyhedra should be preferred. We analyze this rule then by looking at pairs of um, polyhedra and looked yeah, basically how they are connected. And most of them are actually indeed connected by corners, then the edge and then the face connection follow. But if you look at individual structures, you will see that a lot of them still show these kind of face connections. So for example, in this perovskite structure type, um, you can you see here um, face connected polyhedra, but also in, in this corundum um, structure type. We were able to improve this rule um, by only focusing on coordination numbers smaller than eight. Um, and then you can see that the face connections really vanish. Um, and then you have a better agreement with what Pauling um, has, has seen. So we found a lot of exceptions also to the other rules. Um, and then we did a combined assessment of the rules um, two to five to see um, how well these Pauling rules are actually fulfilled um, by the current data that we're having. Um, we omitted this first rule because um, there's really a strong dependence um, on the kind of radii that you are using. Um, depending on the radii, you might get a different results. So that's why we, we did not include it in this overall analysis. Um, and then we found that only 13% 30 of all structures fulfill um, these rules two to five. Um, if we go to coordination numbers smaller than eight, only structures with coordination numbers smaller than eight, um, we had 20%, it's much, much better. Um, in the case of um, the third rule, it helped very much to reduce these kind of coordination numbers, but um, for the overall assessment, um, it didn't. 
So you can see these polling routes nowadays um, do not really fit to the data that we're having. Um, but of course, also the data that we're having now um, can, can be highly biased because, for example, we are not really including any kind of defects um, in, in many of our simulations. Um, so this is also something for the future, of course, to check again. So now you could ask, of course, why are we not just using data-driven approaches to rediscover our, our chemical knowledge? Um, the problem with this is, of course, that we would need well, not only chemical knowledge, but also physical knowledge, that we would need a lot of data. Um, and that's why I would like to show another um, example from my research. Um, there we've used uh, machine learning interatomic potentials to simulate um, bononic properties. So what you do is you use a large reference database, typically from DFT data, that has information on energies and, and forces. Um, and that you learn uh, with a certain representation of the atomic environment and, and nothing else, um, and, and a certain type of um, regression um, algorithm. And then you get, you learn these energies and forces. Um, we then um, started with um, a gap model um, for silicon that was um, developed in uh, 2018 um, with a lot of data on, on diamond type silicon, on um, defect structures, um, grain boundaries, and, and so on. And we computed phonons, the phonon band structures, the vibrational properties um, for um, this diamond type silicon. And, and what we saw is um, that it the, the, the um, result from the GAP-18 model um, was agreeing very well to the DFT data, although they, this worked really well. Um, but as I said, it's not really a surprise as there are many diamond type structure in this kind of database. Um, when we went on with more complex structures, um, such as class rate one, we already saw a yeah, much larger, larger discrepancy, larger devi deviations. Um, and we then also took um, 11 other um, crystal structures from the materials project database and computed a phonon error um, along this, this phonon band structure. Um, it should be, of course, in the ideal case um, at zero. It should be fitting very well to the DFT data. Um, but we found an error that was always larger than for diamond type, type silicon and for these other more complex crystal structures. But we were able um, to arrive at uh, a good gap model um, when we were um, constructing new reference databases. So we took data from the materials project database on crystalline materials, built um, their supercells with individual and random distortions, um, and included this in this initial um, gap 18 database. Um, and then fitted and evaluated all these kind of models. And we also did something on the regularization that these kind of structures where only one um, atom is displaced um, could be learned, learned better. Um, and then we were able to um, arrive at the potential that is really able to, to capture these, these phonons. Um, so we were able to reduce this, this phonon error very much. Um, we were also able to keep the good performance of this um, model for amorphous prep properties, and we've reached really a level of accuracy that is similar um, to DFT. But the point that I wanted to make is that the data curation was really crucial in this kind of process. So you really have to be careful um, that you have everything um, included in your database to learn the kind of physics and, and chemistry behind. Yeah, um, maybe short information on, on these material interatomic potentials that we use. So we use this um, Gaussian approximation framework um, and we used um, the SOAP um, descriptor. If you'd like to know more um, about this, there are extensive reviews about these kind of approaches also. Um, and to give also motivation while we looked at phonons, um, the thing is of, that it really takes a very long time to compute phononic properties based on DFT. There are currently only small databases available, so there's really a need for speed up in, in these kind of approaches. And also, if you look at interactions between phonons, um, thermal conductivity, um, there's now a lot of research going on to use these kind of interatomic potentials for these kind of properties. 
Um, now I'm switching already in, in this part um, of, of automation, um, but it's, it's still connected to these, these phonon computations. Um, I wanted just to highlight um, that um, we were actually able to realize the large project that I was talking about in a very short time frame um, because we could rely on open source codes. Um, so we had um, Parmesan to access the materials project. We were able to plot the phonon band structures, compute uh, the densities of states, and so on with the help of Parmesan. Um, we used Phonopy to um, compute phonons with finite displacement method. Um, and for the interatomic potentials, we were able to use a combination of CRIPI and the atomic uh, simulation environment. Um, and in this context, I wanted to mention um, that it's really important that we also think about these, these open software communities um, because we are all relying on these kind of codes. And I think it's a good audience um, to highlight this also um, because you're all, all um, somehow related to the materials projects or using the materials project, for example. And this is a paper on how to be a good community member of the scientific software community. Um, so there's basically a checklist um, that everyone can, can read um, and check. Um, it says, for example, that um, the researchers should try to solve the problem first, um, maybe um, yeah, also ask in the right place. Um, things like citing, acknowledging software is really important, um, and maybe also contributing back um, to the community at some point. So if you've developed some code, it might be good also to think about giving that, that back to, to some of the packages that are around so that they can, can stay around and can develop further. Um, on the other hand, it also sets some standards for a good community. Um, as it says, it should be really welcoming, um, of course, um, to new users, um, yeah, encouraging um, for them to participate. And this, of course, also will, will help um, yeah, these, these kind of softwares to, to grow. Um, and this also decides, of course, in the future, which kind of softwares um, are, are used. Um, and now I would like to... Um, Go fully to this uh, last part on automation. So we automatized a process um, that is based on, on DFT and, and bonding analysis, of course, with the aim of finding new chemical knowledge and um, getting data on chemical bonds. Yeah, um, this is, of course, connected again to this picture here. We need more data to do this kind of uh, data-driven science. So we also need automation. I think this is very obvious. Um, so what is bonding analysis now? So I'm, I'm a chemist, as I said. Um, so I was trained on these molecular orbital diagrams, um, for example, in, in organic or inorganic chemistry. Um, so they tell you something about bonding and anti-bonding molecular orbitals. They can tell you about stabilities of uh, molecules and um, also reactivities and, and all these things. Um, there's now a similar thing in the solid state. Um, it's called um, crystal orbital Hamilton population. And it allows you to estimate, for example, bond strengths and also bonding and anti-bonding contributions. And we do that with a program Lobster um, that, that is developed in, in the group of um, Richard Tronskowski. That's the group where I did my, my PhD. Um, so this bonding analysis, however, is not um, a, a very simple task. Um, we have to do several steps um, because we need to use two programs. And therefore, automatizing um, these kind of processes was really um, necessary to, to get um, large amounts of data. Um, we start with, um, in, in this case, a DFT computation, a VASP computation. We compute um, the wave function in a plane wave based basis set in this case. Um, and then you have a delocalized information. Um, so you cannot really get any information about the chemistry of, of the interactions between atoms. And for, to get this then, um, we need the program Lobster that projects these plane wave based bases to an atomic orbital based basis. Um, and now um, these, this, is we have a localized basis and we can really look at interactions between um, these different atoms. This is then also something that Lobster can do. It can compute these uh, crystal orbital Hamilton population. It can also compute um, charges and so on. 
But as you can imagine also, um, the outputs of this kind of program are also quite complex because you now have interactions between two atoms and not information only, only in one atom. And what we then wanted to have is a workflow that just takes information on the structure, um, computes with VASP and lobster information on the crystal orbital Hamilton populations. And then we wanted to have yeah, an, an easy analyzable output. Um, and we have realized this now with a program package that's called lobster Pi. It will summarize the most important um, bonding interactions in, in this crystal structure, give you an automatic plot and also a text output. I will show you that uh, in a minute, um, how, what, what is included in this kind of uh, automatic output. So this is then how the, the workflow um, lowers in the workflow-like um, scheme. So um, our workflow can now optimize the structure, compute the wave function, test different kind of basis sets, um, and, and summarize um, the data and, and do automatic plots and so on. So we've included this in, in, in Atomat and, and Pymogen. Um, and we've also written a tutorial for this um, that you can have a look at. And this should um, explain how you can use these tools. Um, we've included a lot of um, new classes in, in Pymogen and Atomat um, to deal with all these input and outputs. And we've developed this program LobsterPy, which can do this um, automatic analysis, Python-based, but we also have a command line interface. Um, this is on, on GitHub already. Um, you can simply pip install it with lob, pip install LobsterPy. Um, and as I said, it's also possible to use it via the command line. You can even create um, input files for um, VASP and Lobster without using all of the automation um, in, in Atomet. So it's also useful for people that might not fully want to automatize everything all of their, their analysis. Um, and as I said, we then get um, automated plots and text outputs. It will really find out which are the most important uh, bonds in, in the crystal structure. Um, it will analyze the so, the so called integrated CHPs, ICO. Um, which basically describe the bond strengths. Um, based on this, it will also be able to determine a coordination environment. So we take the positions um, based on the ICO values from, from, from um, the lobster output, put it back into um, KEMENV to find out which kind of um, coordination environment um, we have. So we again use this um, continuous symmetry measures that I talked in the, in the first part of the talk about. Um, and it, then we really get also coordination environments based on the electronic structure. Um, just also to illustrate this difference between coordination environments from the electronic structure and then those based on um, yeah, geometric approaches, um, I'm taking this oxynitride structure here. So you have, um, calcium in a 12 volt coordination, coordinated environment, uh, tantalum in um, um, an octahedron. And if you use a purely um, geometric base code, for example, um, robocrystallographer um, that I very much um, like, and that is also of course available on the Matthias project, um, then you would get calcium is coordinated in a cube octahedron um, and tantalum in an octahedron. In contrast, lobster pi, and will only find the octahedral environment of tantalum. And because the calcium oxygen and calcium nitrogen interactions are very weakly covalent. Um, so we get actually complementary picture, a complementary picture to this um, purely geometric approach. So these purely geometric approaches are, for example, useful for um, diffusion um, properties, so um, lithium diffusion um, and things like that through materials. And I think these, these covalency including approaches um, actually give, give us more information about what really contributes um, to the electronic structure um, of the material, which kind of bonds are relevant here. Um, and Lobsify also allows us, of course, to look at really large um, structures in a very fast way. So for example, we looked at 14111, which is a thermoelectric material. In this case, we looked actually at the magnetism. It's also ferromagnetic. 
And we looked at which bond are actually responsible for um, the ferromagnetism in the compound. And this was really easy to analyze with love supply. Um, and you can really see that in the non-magnetic um, computation, you have anti-bonding states at the Fermi level of this magnesium antimony bonds um, that vanish in um, the ferromagnetic setting. So you can really see which kind of bonds are responsible for um, the ferromagnetism in, in this, this compound. And of course, uh, we would like to use these tools now to compute um, larger data sets and analyze them. Yeah, so reasons for automation are getting reliable um, data for machine learning and data-driven science. Um, but I also wanted to highlight another reason, of course, um, that it also increases usability of code packages. So if you have um, an easy interface um, for, for users, um, easy ways of creating inputs um, using your codes, of course, um, it will be easier. People will do less errors and so on. Um, and I also wanted to highlight some current problems that we have, I think, in automation still. Um, automation takes a lot of time. And I think as you've seen on the example, um, it also yeah, takes a lot of time to build these kind of interfaces. And I would also say that still too much training is necessary for people to, to implement new automation, um, co um, yeah, new interfaces, uh, and use these kind of codes. Yeah. Um, with regard to the usability of code package, I think there were some, some nice development in recent years in, in the, that sense that people are now using um, code agnostic um, workflows also and developing them. So this is an example from um, the computational chemistry um, community that did that already, I think, several years ago. Um, they've worked on um, a Python package um, with code agnostic workflows. And this is, of course, something also that's now um, in, in the mid computation material science community. That of course um, will make it easier to switch maybe in the future between different DFT programs, but still um, there's a lot of uh, maintenance that one has to do. All these different code packages have to be included. Yeah. So at the moment, I think we're still at, at this, this stage um, that we have to yeah, consider which task can be automated actually? So for which tasks um, can I write such an automated workflow? Um, and I think um, also, yeah, new DFT code packages should consider automation as a usability criterion. Um, and maybe in the future, hopefully, we will also think about um, interfaces between automation software so that we do not have to write all this code again and again. Yeah, so I'm now at the summary. Um, of my talk, what I wanted to show is that the spirit of machine learning is was present in chemistry for more than 100 years. And um, we should improve and check existing heuristics with data. I've shown that on the periodic system of elements um, and also on, on the polling routes. So these, these heuristics could be wrong. We might learn also something about um, our current knowledge if we do this. Um, then um, if we use purely data-driven machine learning approaches, of course, our data is also really important. Um, and if we want to use these approaches without including any physical or chemical insight, um, we might need a lot more, more data. Um, and automation plays, of course, also a very crucial part in all of this research. Um, and I think we have to um, yeah, find, find um, yeah, easier ways um, to automatize our DFT computations in the future. Um, now, I also wanted to mention that we're also working on other um, topics, um, especially related to phonons. Um, so in recent years, um, we've contributed to papers um, where we looked, for example, at, at phonons and, and, and thermal conductivity within uh, thermoelectric materials. Um, we've used harmonic phonons um, and, and models for, for scattering um, to understand um, the um, thermal conductivity in, in very large um, crystal structures, such as um, 14111, where we have already a transition from crystalline um, to glass-like materials, and where also um, diffusive properties play a role, um, where you have phonon band structures with bands that are lying really close together, so that they are actually interactions within between these, these kind of phonons. Um, and we've recently also had a look at um, 
this diffusive um, transport and its um, relationship to ionic um, transporting materials. So yeah, now I'm at the end of my talk. Um, I would like to thank um, all the, the collaborators um, on, on these different kind of projects. Um, I would like to thank the materials project community because as you've seen, all these tools played a huge role in this kind of um, research. And I would also, of course, um, very much um, thank my group um, that uh, works on, on these topics um, with me. And I'm really happy um, to take your questions also now. Thank you very much. Hey, thank you, Janine, for the wonderful talk. Uh, I forgot to also mention in your, in your introduction that you're also very active on Twitter. So your handle is at Molecular Extel. So you can also uh, see yeah. more of what Janine is up to on Twitter as well. Um, as questions are rolling in, uh, feel free to keep ask, asking uh, questions in the Q&A panel. Let me just get started with one question really quick uh, as the questions come in, which is, uh, in the beginning of your talk, you showed how you could test the polling rules with uh, yeah. you know, data-driven approaches. Is there a way you think that the computers can generate hypotheses for new rules uh, that then can be tested versus, you know, having the hypothesis yourself and then, you know, uh, testing it with the data? Yeah. Yeah, um, I think I think it's of course when when we're still of course um, looking for for solutions in in, in this regard. Um, but of course, one one can use um, the data on the coordination environments and and try to find these these patterns back in the data, and then of course trying with the help of interpretable machine learning methods to find um, rules back. But of course. So I think um, a lot of research in this regard is, is, is still going on um, and it will, I think that, that there have been some, some um, recent investigation on synthesizability of materials in this kind of machine learning um, uh, with machine learning methods, but I, I haven't seen an interpretable model yet that we could use to derive um, Kind of, kind of um, human readable, understandable rules. But this, is, of course, would be an ideal goal um, to use these kind of um, interpretable um, machine learning models to, to get new rules and um, get a new chemical understanding. Yeah. So, yeah, I think there are ways. Yeah. Yeah, um, just because it's certainly a very, very challenging problem. So, yeah. Um, so if you can see, Janine, the Q&A mm -hmm. panel, um, you know, uh, you can go ahead and just pick whichever questions that look uh, interesting to you, and then we'll just mark them as being answered as we go through them. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, yeah, let us know if you have any, any issues with looking at the Q&A, but you can, people can keep the questions rolling in. Yeah, okay, I will just start with, um, yeah. Um, so there's a question that's called, does lobster pie automatically try different localized basis sets until it obtains the best one? Um, so lobster pie um, will um, give you inputs for all um, possible um, basis sets that, that can be used in combination uh, with the um, pseudopotentials that you have. Um, and then it's still up to you to decide which is the best projection. Um, so you can, for example, use um, things like the charge billing to assess this um, or have a look at the density of states, whether this makes sense or use your, your chemical intuition um, on these kind of things. For example, if you, if you know um, how the valence orbitals should look like, it should be also easy um, to, access this, to assess this here. Um, okay, then, then I will maybe... Um, answer another question on lobster pie that I'm seeing. So you can also use, of course, um, bonding analysis for structures with defects if you have a model that you can put into BASP. So if you can generate um, a wave car for your model, um, you can also um, use bonding analysis for this and analyze this. Um, I hope this also an answers this question. Um, so I'm sorry, I'm not reading all the names. Um, then there's a question on um, the relationship between lobster to um, Vanya 90. Um, I've, I've, I've never compared lobster to Vanya 90, but it's 
loss is also a way on uh, of of localizing this this kind of basis function, and we typically use this for um, these the computation of the crystal orbital Hamilton populations. Um, it's, I think it's just another way of, of localizing um, your plane waves um, and, and giving a different uh, picture of the situation in, in the crystal structure, maybe a more chemical, um, chemical um, picture of, of um, the crystal structure. Um, so there's, oh, okay. Um, there's then a larger, um, question that um, I first have to understand fully. Ah, okay, sorry. Um, I think uh, I have to, <laughs> I might also um, have to answer some of the questions afterwards because I have to think a bit um, further about them. Um, yeah, also, yeah, LOPSAPI at the moment only works um, with VASP. Um, that's also another question that was asked, um, but we could um, in include, um, um, yeah, um, support for, for other, for other um, um, tools as well. I think there's just a few things you have to read in the structure differently um, where we, we could do this. Um, otherwise, I think um, the, the outputs from LOPSA are the same. Um, just also creating of um, input files, of course, is also not possible. Um, I'm so sorry. Um, <laughs> with quest choosing questions. Um, Oh, okay, there's a question on um, the, so the, the idea of that um, old uh, machine learning methods, for example, the periodic table of, of, of elements um, that they worked um, uh, different um, with modern machine learning um, approaches. So in the development of the periodic table, people design new experiments to fill spaces where data points are sparse and still needed. Um, to my knowledge, um, today's ML approaches do not do this. Instead, they work with the data available. Um, would it be possible to extend the modern approach to teach them to come up with um, new experience to fill the data spaces and consider um, too sparse? Yeah, I think um, based on active learning approaches, um, people are actually doing this, especially for things like the machine learning, um, interatomic potentials. So they are now um, ways of, um, so they, they basically, with these um, machine learning interatomic potential that I've shown, you can also estimate um, the kind, kind of error that you're having. Um, and you can um, go to spaces in, or just compute a new energy in force. And then of course, compare this with um, DFT and see how far this is off um, and retrain your models. Um, so this, this kind of active learning is already very really present. Of course, it's really hard to do this um, with, with data on um, crystal structures. Of course, with automation, you can also use these kind of um, active learning approaches and go into spaces which, which have not been looked at very well so far. Um, but I think it, it would be really hard to do that for something like um, the polling groups at the moment. So yes, I think that there, there are ways of doing this. So you can look at um, parts of your, your um, chemical um, space that is really sparse and then um, add this um, to, to your um, results. Um, there's a question on the um, interatomic potential that I talked about. Um, so these these were um, Gaussian um, they were in, in Gaussian based on a Gaussian process um, scheme, and um, they they can be included in MD codes like LAMPS. It's actually also done in this paper, 
um, that was a collaboration with Walker Deringer. He did um, the computation of amorphous materials um, with lamps. So it's possible to include these um, also in, in codes like the lamps. Um, there is, there's a question on um, the basis functions in Lobster. Um, so they are based on Slater type orbitals. Um, yeah, so they are um, hydrogen like um, wave functions. So they are based on, on, on computational um, chemistry ideas, yes. Um, and there's a, a question on um, my my personal opinion of how much of our chemical understand of our understanding of chemistry um, will change in our opinion. <laughs> um, yeah, I think as you've seen on this periodic table of elements example, um, I think if, if we do not know much about a new phenomena, I think um, over time, this can of course drastically change. Um, I, I, for example, for the crystal structures that we have now um, and, and without any kind of defects, I think, um, we are already at a very good point because we have a lot of data already. So I think in this regard, um, they, they, this should be kind of stable. So, but it's of course really hard to estimate these kind of things. Um, but I would expect of course that in the future we will learn a lot more about how to treat defects, how to include defects in our simulations, how to um, understand these kind of things. Um, Then, yeah, sorry, I'm, I'm really just going through the questions and I'm not really good at picking these questions. So um, it's just what I understand immediately I will answer. Um, there was uh, a question about um, more features um, with regard to lobster pie. Um, yeah. Um, making a simplified molecular interaction diagram would, of course, uh, be something um, that would be really interesting. Um, and we are, of course, thinking about extending it, but um, making this very generalizable is, is not very, I would say, easy at the moment. I think these kind of developments, um, also extensions, would take some time. Um, but we're learning, of course, um, more, um, and I hope um, that they will be a lot of features in the future also in lobster pie that help um, to really drive this this kind of chemical understanding. So yes, molecular interaction diagrams would also be something that could be interesting. Then there's a question on these machine learning interatomic potentials, whether they have um, been used on interfacial thermal transport via phonons. I think I've seen some recent work um, that is actually that, um, but I'm not sure about the group. Um, I think they're looking at um, thermal transport in wire grain boundaries. So I think there should be something in literature already. Um, I think there's work going on, but I haven't tried it um, for them. Um, but people are exploring um, these ML potentials more and more um, for thermal transport. And as, um, as um, yeah, it's also now available, for example, to use these, these machine learning interatomic potentials in BASP, I think um, it will be used much more. Of course. Um, then there is a question on, on why the gap 18 data not give good phonons. Um, the thing was um, that it was mostly trained on um, diamond type um, structures, um, also grain boundaries. Um, so the problem was more that this, this complexity, so these, these other crystal structures um, were not very similar to diamond. So basically the um, chemical space that we had in, in this initial gap 18 potential was too narrow. So we had to include other kind of crystal structures to make sure um, 
that um, this space is covered. And there are also now a lot of active learning approaches where people also use um, structure prediction with these kind of trained machine learning into atomic potentials, compare this to DFT, and then include more um, structures and try to really explore the chemical space. This should get much better. But this was one of the problems. Um, as I said, for diamond type silicon, this worked pretty really well. Um, and then, of course, I think um, for phonons, it's also especially important to have um, for harmonic phonons to have this small dis data on, on small displacements um, so that you just displace one atom and then um, learn, learn these forces and energies very well because it's, this is very similar to what you would do in, in the finite displacement method. Okay. Um, trying to see which question I can answer. Um, yeah, Janine, this, we can also post yeah. some of these questions afterwards um, at that link for the okay. seminar. Yeah. So yeah. if you feel that you've kind of exhausted what you what you can answer for now, we can start transferring those. But just let us know if you, yeah. if you feel like, yeah. Yeah, I think um, it was maybe, um, I have to see. There, there are some questions that are um, quite long. Ah, yeah, okay, there was just maybe just one last question. Um, can you explore, explain more detailed on ML for these, these force constants? Um, what data property um, is needed for ML so that you can improve the phonon band significantly? Yeah, I think in this case, really, um, supercells, including one or two displacement, random displacements were really needed um, to, to get at this phonon data. Um, some people also use um, MD simulations as a, as a basis for these kind of um, thermal properties um, so that you can really cover um, yeah, the, the whole space. Um, but I think especially those close to what you would do uh, in a harmonic phonon computation are, are relevant. Yeah. And yeah, I think the other questions, um, they're, they're, one, also, they're really interesting, but I, I think I would need to think a few more seconds about them. Hey, thank you, Janine, so much for taking the time to give the talk as well as uh, answer all these wonderful questions. Um, if you would like to discuss further, we'll have a page at materialsproject.org slash seminars. I've just put the link in the chat as well. Um, so feel free to continue the discussion with, with, the, with the group there. Uh, and of course, you can uh, contact Janine directly if you have other questions. So thank you again, Janine, um, and uh, we will see you all at the next seminar. Bye-bye. Thank you very much.